want to thank you all for coming out today. Thank you for those who are watching through social media. And uh, we're going to uh, begin this message going back to around 740 to 750 B.C., and a long time ago, 750 years before the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And uh, this is the time of King Ahaz. Ahaz, probably the most evil king to ever rule over Judah. Wicked. Just downright wicked. Died at a very young age. Died by disease because he wouldn't give it over to the Lord. He sought the sorcerers. They say, the Bible says physicians, but we, these physicians were actually sorcerers. When he was told to seek God, and he refused to do that. And that's kind of the situation here in Isaiah 7. The prophet Isaiah says to him in verse 10, we're not going to be in Isaiah very long. We're just going to, this is just the introduction. Uh, Isaiah 7 verse 10 says, Moreover, the Lord spoke again to Ahaz. Ask a sign for yourself from the Lord your God. Ask it either in the depth or in the height above. But Ahaz said, I will not ask. Nor will I test the Lord. This is Ahaz will not ask for a sign from the Lord due to what? Unbelief. Ahaz did not have belief. He was the king over the tribe of Judah, but he had unbelief. Ahaz really wanted, because what the situation is going, let me back up a little bit. The situation is he's about to be invaded by two other nations. He's about to be taken out. He will not seek the Lord because he seeks man. He wants the Assyrians to come to his rescue. So he will not ask the Lord for a sign. Then he said, Hear now, O house of David, it is a small thing for you to weary men, but you will weary my God also? It means to doubt the promises of men is one thing, but to doubt the promise of God is a totally different thing. This speaks of complete unbelief on the part of the wicked Ahaz. And so Isaiah comes back in verse 14 and tells him, he says, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Whether you want one or not, Ahaz, you're going to get it. The Lord is going to give you a sign, whether you like it or not. And because the Lord is telling him, he's trying to get Ahaz to turn to him. He's trying to him get Ahaz to stop looking to other men. Stop looking to yourself, Ahaz. Look to me. He will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son. And shall call his name Emmanuel. Hallelujah. Glory to God. This is foretold 750 years before the birth of Christ. That a virgin shall conceive. A very son and his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Praise the Lord. So this sign, how is this a sign to Ahaz? It's to tell Ahaz, regardless of what happens to you, Judah is going to continue. Judah will not be destroyed because out of Judah, out of the tribe of Judah, will come the Lord Jesus Christ, Emmanuel, God with us. He, because he will come from the lineage of David, from the house of David. Regardless of what you do, Ahaz, this plan is going forward with or without you. Now jump forward about 350 years. To the time of Malachi. We're now at 400, right around 400 BC. Malachi writes the last, speaks the last words in the canon of scripture of the Old Testament. And then what happens at the closing of Malachi's prophecies, total silence from the Lord. 
for 400 years. Not one prayer will be answered. The Lord will not speak to any prophets. Total silence from heaven as Israel is plunged into spiritual darkness by their own choice. Israel constantly looking to self. The Pharisees and the Sadducees thought greatly of themselves and not so great of God and plunged themselves into spiritual darkness. In fact, it, it became a point of Israel wasn't even saved anymore. The leadership was just dragging them further and further from God as they gave praise to themselves in the streets. And the angel Gabriel would appear before Mary, some 400 years of silence. But now the angel Gabriel, sent by the Lord himself, in Luke chapter 1. Anybody wants to turn there, I'll give you a second. The birth of our Lord and Savior is told in different Gospels. I believe Luke, we're going to be in Luke today, chapters 1 and 2 is where we're going to primarily be. Luke tells the best story. He gives a complete story of the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And uh, probably because Luke was the most intelligent of the four, and uh, of all of them, for that matter, but of the four Gospels, Luke was an uh, educated man. He was actually a physician, very intelligent, very thorough in his writings, very observant. Luke chapter 1, verse 31. Gabriel is now speaking to Mary to tell her. He says, And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. Jesus means in Hebrew means Savior. He shall be the Savior to his people. Israel had gone so far into darkness. The sin was as black as could be. Let me tell you, it was running rampant as the, the devil and his minions were having their way throughout the world. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. Amen. Hallelujah. He will come through the lineage of King David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. In his kingdom, there will be no end. This kingdom will last forever and ever and ever. There will be no end to his kingdom. Praise be to God. And that's the title for today's message. His kingdom shall never end. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father in heaven, hallelujah. Lord, I just pray for your presence of your spirit here today to speak through me, Lord. Lord, that I not commit any violence to your word, but speak it in truth, Lord, as you speak through me and anoint those to hear this message that you anoint me to preach. And Father, I just pray, I commit myself, I give over self to you, Lord. I die to self here today and preach your word. Hallelujah. And I ask it in the name of Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior. Your blessing be upon this word today, dear Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Pick it up with uh, Luke 1, uh, verse 34. Said then Mary said to the angel, How can this be since I do not know a man? She was a virgin. How can I conceive a child and bear this Son of the Most High that God Himself would come through my womb when I haven't even known a man, nor was she even married at the time? She was engaged, I guess you could say, to uh, Joseph, but the wedding hadn't taken place. And the angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. Praise be to God. And the power of the highest will overshadow you. The power of God will overshadow her. As God the Father 
by the Holy Spirit, will plant the baby Jesus into her womb. Jesus will leave his throne as the Son of the living God and come down to earth. He'll leave heaven and humble himself and become man, clothe himself in flesh, they say. Therefore also that Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. This must have just blown Mary's mind. I am going to be the one to bring forth the Savior of the world. That God found favor in Mary because she was pure. She was the closest thing that it was the, I guess, the best woman that God could find. And he knew that she loved him. And God loved her. But she would have to accept this. She couldn't say, no, no. How many times has God called us to do something? And we'd like, oh, uh, yeah, God, uh, I'll let you know on that. (laughs) There was no, (laughs) Mary submitted to what God wanted her to do. We drop down to verse 38. John 1, 38 says, Then Mary said, Behold the maidservant of the Lord. This speaks of her humility, the maidservant of the Lord. Praise God. And he says, she says, let it be me according to your word. She some fully submits to what God wants. That she will bring forth that Savior. She died to self. And the angel departed from her. Praise the Lord. So now we see Mary has fully submitted to what God's desires are for her to bring forth the Savior. This would require a lot, okay? This isn't just a matter of allowing the Lord to implant Jesus in her woman. Somebody's going to have to raise that child, (laughs) okay? And uh, so she's going to have to protect this child. You understand? This is the Lord. This is God in the flesh. You've got to make sure you protect him and keep him out of harm's way and feed him and nourish him and teach him the right things. In Luke chapter 2, verse 1 says, And it it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. What does that mean? All the world should be registered. Well, obviously... This is a census. We have census here in the United States. You want to know how many people you got in your home? Well, the purpose of this was for taxation. Caesar Augustus apparently had foolishly spent some money or something. I don't know. He needed money. So we're going to do a census. We're going to find out how many people we got. We're going to tax them to death. <laughs> so what did they, back then it was different. Now... How does it work now? They come around and knock on your door, right? They want to know who lives here and how many people. And uh, they want to know your income level and all these things. And, and a lot of people don't want to answer the door. But back then, you were required to go back to your home. To go back to where your family was, where you were born. And Joseph just happened to have been born in Bethlehem. That was his home, the house of David. This is where King David came from. Bethlehem. So this census first took place while Quirinius was governing Syria. So all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. So Mary and Joseph, here she is, nine months pregnant. And she's going to have to make that trip about 80 miles from Nazareth all the way to Bethlehem. So Joseph also went up from Galilee and out of the city of Nazareth into Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. Bethlehem, like I said, the city of David. And it was foretold hundreds of years later that the Savior would be born in Bethlehem. And God, is what is he, what's God doing here? He's using Caesar Augustus to get the job done. Joseph would have never made the trip to Bethlehem had he not been told by Caesar, you got to go. 
So God laid it on Caesar's heart, Augustus' heart, to bring this census. So God will use unsaved men. He will use heathen men to get the job done. Don't think because someone's a sinner or they're tired or they're uh, maybe they're not saved and, and because they don't go to church or maybe they... Uh, <coughs> They don't, what you may say, well, they're not saved, and they're probably not. Don't think God can't use them. And don't think that what they're not doing, what they are doing, isn't of God, because it might just be God's plan, okay? So God will use unsaved people. Look at King Cyrus. King Cyrus, God used him to topple the Babylonian Empire to set the Jews free. Okay, so to free Israel from 70 years of bondage, God will use heathen men. To be registered with Mary and betrothed his wife who was with child. Micah 5, 2 backs up what I just said. But you, Bethlehem, though you are little among thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me. The one to be a ruler in Israel who is going forth are from of old, from everlasting, an everlasting kingdom, a kingdom that shall never end. Amen. And Luke 2, 6 says, so it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered, for her to deliver the child. The very child that would give his life that men could be delivered from the bondage of sin. Luke 4.18 says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, Jesus says, because he hath faith, he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. To preach the gospel to the poor in spirit. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. God came. Jesus came. He came down here to earth. And was born a child. And clothed himself in flesh. Became a man. And he came to heal the brokenhearted. Praise God. Praise God. And then pay attention now. To preach deliverance to the captives. Notice he didn't say to deliver the captives. He said to preach deliverance to the captives. It's your choice if you want to be delivered. It's your choice if you want to listen to it. He came to preach deliverance. And that's the job of every pastor today. To preach deliverance to the captives. We've all been captives. At one time in our life, probably more than once, we've been held captive to Satan in something, some type of bondage, regardless of what it is. And some of you may still be going through these things. That doesn't mean you're not saved. It means that Satan's just trying to get a foothold on you. Because he knows you're saved. He knows you're a child of God. And he wants to destroy you. That's why pastors should be preaching deliverance. And the deliverance comes in one way, and that's the cross of Jesus Christ. There is deliverance no other way. Luke 2, 7 says, And she brought forth her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling cloths, and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. Let me explain something to you. The inn, this wasn't the Hilton, okay? <laughs> Bethlehem, a very small village, humble, a lot of poor people. Jesus of Nazareth, he was uh, not born in Nazareth, but grew up in Nazareth. People refused to believe that this Jesus character, that he's the son of the living God, would come out of Nazareth. Nazareth was full of heathens. Nazareth, there's, there's nothing good in Nazareth. How could that be? And the same thing with Bethlehem. Nobody believed it. There was, like I said, there was no room for them at the end. There was, this wasn't the Hilton. The, the end that it speaks of is a place of where the poorest of the poor would stay. It's just a room with four walls and a dirt floor 
And sometimes they didn't even have a ceiling. And there was no room for Jesus at the end. But they ended up in a stable. This speaks of the true humility of our Lord Jesus Christ to be born a peasant. Praise God. There was no room for them in the end. Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flocks by night. So here we have shepherds outside of Bethlehem, watching over their flock by night, doing what the Lord has called them to do. But one would think that the announcement of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ would come first to the leadership of Israel, the, the religious leadership, the hierarchy, right? Who, as we read on, we'll soon find out that they weren't told. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before these shepherds, stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. They probably never seen anything like this, but I remind you, been 400 years of silence from the Lord. Then the angel said to them, do not be afraid. Once again, do not be afraid. For behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. All people. Praise God. Great joy, good and glad tidings to all people. Not just Israel, but all people. No matter what color your skin is, doesn't matter where you live in the world, he came to save the entirety of the world. His kingdom shall never end. Never. And there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. The one who came to save the entirety of the human race from the malady of sin. They had needed a savior. And this will be the sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in a manger. Amen. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest. Glory to God in the highest. These shepherds are giving glory to God. That's what we do every Sunday when we come in here. We sing our worship music. We're being giving glory to God. And it says, and on earth peace. Yes. To bring peace on earth. You know, there's only been one time in recorded history that there was complete peace throughout the entirety of the world. And it was the 33 and a half years that Jesus walked the earth because peace had come to the world. The gates of Janus in Rome stayed closed because there was no war. And when the, shortly after the death and crucifixion of Jesus, the gates of Janus were flung open so the soldiers could go in and out because they were at war again. Jesus brought peace. And that's what he can do in your life. He can bring peace and glad tidings and joy in the hearts of all those who will believe in him. He's the Prince of Peace. Hallelujah. There will be no peace on earth until he returns. At the second coming of the Lord, then there will be peace for a thousand years. Praise God. Goodwill toward men. It's always God's will, the things that we always have goodwill. God doesn't wish anything bad upon him. We talked about that this morning in the Word for Every Day. God, it's not God's will that we suffer. And, but there are consequences for sin. But he brings goodwill. In fact, David wrote in Psalm 84, he says, For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. Praise God. No good thing will be withheld from those who walk uprightly. 
No good thing will be withhold for those who walk uprightly, those who walk in righteousness, in God's righteousness, because the Spirit of God dwells in you. You are saved. You love the Lord, and you walk after His Spirit. That's walking upright, walking in His righteousness. Nothing you've done, but what He did for you, and your faith in that. O Lord of hosts, blessed is the man who trusts in you. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord Jesus Christ. Luke 2, verse 15. So it was, when the angels had gone away from them and into heaven, that the, le the shepherds, I say lepers, <laughs> that the shepherds said to one another, let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. I believe the translation should have better been translated. Let us see this. Let us see him that has come to pass, this, that this thing. But anyway, uh, these angels <laughs> visited these lowly shepherds. He chose the Lord chose the lowly shepherds over the leadership of Israel. While having ignored the high priest as well as all the religious leaders of Israel. But why? Why wouldn't God go to send the angel to the Pharisees? We understand the Pharisees, the Sadducees, they were too busy looking at themselves and exalting themselves and not God, they had plunged into spiritual darkness. Kind of the way the world, much of the world is today, spiritual darkness. Kind of the way the church is, much of the modern church today is in spiritual darkness. Because they're not looking to the cross of Jesus Christ. James, the brother of Jesus, said it best. God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. These were humble shepherds. They were lowly shepherds. The religious leaders of Israel were eaten up with pride. Pride, the very thing that got Lucifer thrown out of heaven. The very first sin, pride. Being proud, self-pride. Experience, they experienced no revelation from the Lord. I'll read the second half of verse 15 again in Luke 2. It says, Let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass. What does Bethlehem mean in Hebrew? Anybody know? It means house of bread. Bethlehem is the house of bread. So in other words, they're going to the house of bread. Amen. <laughs> They're going to the house of bread to see the true bread. Hallelujah. The true bread who has come down from heaven. Amen. The true bread, the Lord Jesus Christ, has come down from heaven. In John 6, Jesus would say, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He who believes on me has everlasting life, because his kingdom is eternal. It's a kingdom that will never end. You will have everlasting life. I am the bread of life, Jesus says. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness that are, are now dead. They ate the manna in the wilderness and are now dead. This is the bread which comes down from heaven that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread, Jesus said, pointing to himself. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. Praise be to God. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. This speaks of him dying on the cross, giving his life. He is the bread of life. He was born in the house of bread. They came to see the living bread, the, the house of bread, where the bread that came down from heaven, the bread of life, the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. <sighs> Wrapping it up here. <sighs> it says, Now when they had seen him, 
they made widely known the saying which was told them concerning this child. Lowly shepherds were the first preachers to proclaim his birth. They would go out and tell everyone what they had witnessed. Tell everyone what they had seen, heard. Everyone who would listen, I'll put it that way. But how much today, how much are we doing that today as believers? Are we just comfortable in our pew, per se? Are we comfortable with the fact that we're saved and that the rest of our family may not be? I don't know about you, but it bothers me. I know there's members of my family that are not saved. Are we comfortable with that? We shouldn't be. We should be out there declaring the Lord Jesus Christ. I do it all the time. I preach to pharmacists, cashiers. I give them the Lord, the word of the Lord. Whether they want to hear it or not, most want to hear it. Sometimes it's just saying, God bless you. You know? Plant that seed in their heart. Let them know that you love the Lord, the Lord loves them. You know? Everywhere we go, we should let our light shine. The light of Jesus Christ, who lives in us, should be shining constantly. Let me tell you. People should be able to look at you and say, he's a Christian, she's a Christian. Should be able to know the difference. And be able to tell. You should be, like I said, if you were put on trial, if being Christianity, Christian was a crime, be found guilty, right? You want to be found guilty of that. But the evidence would be overwhelming. It wouldn't take the jury long to decide on that. These lowly shepherds had a joyous story to tell, and so do we. Amen. And someone came and died to save us from our sins. Amen. The only thing that's going to keep us out of heaven is a lack of repentance. Not repenting of our sins is what's going to keep us out of heaven. So the Lord Jesus came with the answer. He came and died. An innocent man had to die. They told it with great joy that his kingdom would never end. And you might say, as I'm getting ready to close here, Becky, if you want to get ready. How do you know this, Pastor? How is his kingdom going to live forever? Jesus died 2,000 years ago. You know, the the apostles, the disciples thought it was over. They were lost. They, they were confused. They didn't know. Why didn't he take himself off that cross? They didn't understand. But they soon would. And let me tell you something. For those of you that are here today, it's the Spirit of God that drew you in here, okay? And he'll use your family members and friends and people to get his job done, to draw you into the house of God. It's very important to be in the house of God. There are many people, you can talk to them and say, oh no, I, we give up on that church thing. And you people on Facebook, you listen to me, okay? <laughs> oh, I don't get it. we don't go to church no more. We just, me and my wife, we sit home and have church. And Well, let me ask you this. How does that further the kingdom of God? Just you and your spouse sitting there and praying and reading the word and calling it church. Is that furthering the kingdom of God? You're satisfied in your own salvation. Yeah, I understand the word of God says we're two or more gathered in my name. I will be in the midst amongst them. But it also says in Hebrews 10, 25, forsake not the assembling of ourselves. To assemble in the house of God. To be where his spirit is. You're not going to have a Holy Ghost moment sitting on your couch. But it's important that we be in the house of God on a regular basis. Now I'll tell you why. I know the reason why it's important. Because we become, when we don't come in the house of God and hear His Word preached, we become what? 
doubters. How is that, Pastor? How do we become doubters of his word? How do we become doubters? Well, who was it? Thomas? Remember Thomas? Remember the phrase, the doubting, you're doubting Thomas? That was because Thomas doubted that the Lord had been resurrected and was walking the earth again. He didn't believe them. Why? Because he didn't show up to the meetings they were holding. When the Lord appeared to them in a room amongst the disciples, Thomas wasn't present. He was off doing whatever he was doing. So Jesus had to come back again when Thomas was present and said, put your fingers in the holes in my hands and my side. You don't believe in me. It's important to be in the house of God. It was important that Thomas should have been there the first time. Because of a lack of faith, a lack of belief, he became a doubter. He had to have the physical evidence. We got to walk by blind faith. Okay? We got to believe. It's important to be in the house of God. But how do I know that his kingdom shall never die. His kingdom shall live and reign forever. But where is his kingdom? Where is the kingdom of God? Let me tell you where it is. It's right here in the heart of this man, in the heart of this woman, and this man, and this woman, and you, and every one of you. It's in your heart. In the heart of the believer. You too, Becky. <laughs> it's in your heart and it lives in your heart Jesus says out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks so if the kingdom of God is in your heart then speak the kingdom of God to everyone you meet amen how are we ever going to get the world saved if we ain't out there talking about it the shepherds were shouting glory in the highest Glory in the highest. That's what we do when we come here every Sunday. That's why we worship the Lord. We begin with worship. It's to sing glory in the highest. To exalt the Lord Jesus Christ who gave his life. Some people, spiritually immature, will give glory and praise to the Holy Spirit. That's not what the Word of God tells us. Worship. Give glory to the one who gave his life. The one who completed the works. Yeah, but I'm not taking anything away from the Holy Spirit. He is God, okay? But he will point you to Christ every time. He'll always point you to Jesus Christ, the one who did, completed the works. Because of what Christ did is what saved you. Praise God. But we should be like the lowly shepherds. We're going to sing a song before we finish today. They went out and did what? They went out and shouted it from the tops of the mountains and told everyone that Jesus Christ is born. Go tell it on the mountain. And Becky, if you could uh, cue that up, we're going to close today with that song, and then we'll have prayer. If everyone wants to stand, we'll sing that. Go tell it on the mountain for Jesus Christ this day is born. Amen.
is born. Down in a lonely manger, the humble Christ was born, and God sent a salvation. pray right now, Lord, as we go out of here today, Lord, that we will proclaim your Son, Jesus Christ, as Lord and Savior, to preach deliverance to the captives, to share our love for Jesus Christ with others, Lord, and to that by your Spirit we be led. Hallelujah. I thank you, Lord. I pray that your Spirit go with each and every one of us to proclaim the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ and what he did for us at the cross, that he came to save men. He came to die to save men. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name I pray. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen.